coming up on TPI. I remember just everyone was there from the fashion world. And I was kind of looking out over the crowd. It just struck me so profoundly. I was like, is that all there is to life? Hello and welcome to TPI. I'm your host, Muiwa Olariwaji. Thank you for joining me. This year marks 25 years the TPI has been on air. Can you imagine and believe? We're so honored to have had a special place in your living room for over two decades. And we pray that with your support, we can continue to bring you encouraging content, bring it into your space for years to come. Our first story takes us to Jerusalem, where archaeologists discovered some very special items that makes certain Bible stories we know and love come alive. Take a look. At the entrance of the harbor of Caesarea, divers from the Israel Antiquities Authority made a rare discovery. To find two different shipwrecks mixed together on the same site in a different of one, more than 1,000 years. To try to imagine that the ship was wrecked in the Roman period at the site, and then 1,000 years later, another ship was wrecked on maybe on the top of it or in the air of it, it was really interesting. In one area, Charvit and his partner found both bronze coins from the third century and silver coins from the 14th century. They are amazing, actually, from uh, our point of view, because they are telling a story. It's not only the artifacts, it's the whole story of all the shipwreck. What is the ship were doing there? Uh, the period, what was the position or the situation of what was happening with the ship? The treasures also included a bronze eagle figurine, a symbol of Roman rule, and a red gemstone with the carving of a lyre, or what's known as David's harp. In the book of 1 Samuel from the Bible, it says David played his harp for King Saul. They also found a gold ring with the reference from the New Testament. This is the Good Shepherd ring found in the shipwrecks in the Mediterranean, and it helps tell the story of early Christians in the city of Caesarea during the Roman Empire. As we know, the symbol of the Good Shepherd is one of the first symbols of uh, Jesus, and uh, actually the idea of the Good Shepherd was um, adopted by the most of the local population who actually were looking forward into the new religion because in the Old Testament we actually have the reference to the Good Shepherd and his herd. The ring also tells a story about Christians from Caesarea nearly 1700 years ago. To find a ring from the third century when Christianity basically was still underground. Christians were persecuted during the third century. It's only a hundred years later under Constantine that, Christian, that Christianity becomes a state religion. So this is a ring of a, a Christian who lived in a period that Christians were still persecuted and killed, even in Caesarea. I think we have a pretty dramatic find here. Very simple, very laconic, just the male figure bearing the lamb on his shoulders. Almost exactly the same uh, image we can see on the walls of the catacombs in Rome, in the area where actually the services took place. The artifacts, coins, and ring help reconstruct the puzzle of Caesarea's past. The ring is fantastic, of course. I mean, we often find coins from the Roman period. You know, archaeology is like a puzzle. You take different elements, and the wonderful thing in archaeology is that you can piece things together. You know, we have the site, we have the coins, we have the ship, and then this beautiful ring. And everything suddenly comes together. The ring also makes a personal connection. This ring connects you to the people, right? Like, especially when you find something, I'm talking about just myself, when I see something like that, it's something which is very personal in a way, right? You try to imagine the particular person who was wearing this ring, what were his thoughts or beliefs. It's really touching. I'm not a religious person by myself, but when I see something like that, I feel this connection to someone who lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The discoveries also reveal the port of Caesarea had a longer history than previously thought. 
because some of the people or some of the archaeologists were thinking that the uh, harbor was collapsed in the first century AD. Now we realize that the commerce and the ship were coming from all over the Mediterranean also to Caesarea in a later period, especially in the uh, late Roman and early Byzantine periods. Caesarea played a prominent role in the early church. The Book of Acts documents the first Christian baptism of a non-Jew happened there, and from Caesarea, the Apostle Paul helped take the gospel to the world. How amazing that a ring from the third century was able to be uncovered. The mysteries of the Bible continue to be revealed right before our eyes. And that's perfect segue for our next story. Christian apologist Lisa Fields is the founder of the Jude 3 Project, an organization that helps people of color to see themselves in the biblical narrative. Producer Erica Linney sat down with Lisa to find out more about her mission. But I think of the goodness and all he has done for me. The Christian church has been a deep and rich tradition for people of color worldwide. However, as time and generations have passed, many begin to question the faith of their forefathers. Why would you ever, you know, um, how can you say, yield yourself, you know, um, to the faith um, that has been used to uh, perpetuate your oppression. Christian apologetics leader Lisa Fields saw the need for answers. So she created the Jew 3 Project, an organization dedicated to helping black Christians know what they believe and why. My father introduced me to apologetics. In undergrad, all I saw was older white men and reading books from them. And I was like, you know, I feel like there's a huge gap as a as it relates to how they communicate and the questions they're answering. And so I was like, there's some questions that need to be answered for our community. Jude 3 teaches apologetics and biblical literacy through podcasts, conferences, and online courses. One class is based on Lisa's book titled, Through the Eyes of Color. It walks you through basically the fundamentals, interpreting how to interpret the Bible correctly. Then we go to uh, Black presence in the Bible, early African Christianity, then we go to uh, the uh, contributions of black churches. Then we deal with black cults. And then we talk about how to handle passages in the Bible around women and slavery. And so we want to get people connected with the truth and know how to interpret the scripture, know the history of Christianity. And so that's kind of the approach we take with, with this book. In recent years, black Christians have called into question how the Bible and the Christian faith were used to colonize and enslave Africans. There has been a lot of question about the influence of white supremacy in Christianity. I personally know black Christians who have started investigating other religions like Hebrew Israelites because they feel alienated. Mm -hmm. What have you been hearing and what is your answer for that? I did a, uh, a lecture at um, University of Toronto and the black students there were struggling with the same questions. Uh, there is the, some of the in the U.S. And then hearing from people um, in, in Africa who, who love our stuff. We have a big U.K. fan base saying the same thing. And so I think it's a common struggle amongst Black people all across the world. You know, colonization, them seeing uh, Christianity as a white man's religion, as a tool from them to take their wealth. And people are trying to kind of go back to African religions, ancestral religions, mm -hmm. because they think, man, if this is what my ancestors practice, I need to practice this because I don't want to adopt a faith that just strips me of my resources and oppresses me further. And so they can't disassociate uh, the message of the gospel from people who they feel like don't further oppress them. And so one of the things we like to do is point people back to the heart of God for justice. You see throughout the Proverbs, you see throughout the prophets that God has a heart for justice. He has a heart for the marginalized and pointing people to the text. Anybody can misuse anything. You know, we, th we think about the slave Bible that was created. And what did they do with the slave Bible? They took out most of the passages that are, were about liberation and justice because they perverted the text. And I always tell people, you know, anti-literacy laws were formed really um, to keep uh, slaves from reading the scripture. So one of the ways you protest white supremacy is to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation as it came. But if you read it in this context, you're actually protesting. Lisa 
Musa also points believers to early African Christianity, which is often left out of the Western theological narrative. I point them to early African Christianity to let them know that our core Christian doctrines were um, formed by Black people, uh, Athanasius, who fought for the the understanding that uh, Jesus was fully God and fully man. The fact that we have the word Trinity comes from an African, Tertullian. And so all of that really helped showing them the Black presence in the Bible, showing them the rich contributions of Black people um, in the U.S. Uh, that were Christians really helps to change that narrative so they could see a different perspective. And, and we have to know that just because something has been misused doesn't mean, just because the Bible has been misused doesn't mean that it's a, not a tool for our liberation. Um, from liberation from sin and liberation in this life as well. So how do we reconcile while we're trying to figure out who we are and still embrace and love in Christ? How do we do that? I think we tell the truth as it is written. I think a lot of a lot of what the problem is, is people are not telling the truth about the Bible. They're not telling the truth about the history of it, who's in it. And I think telling that truth and, and highlighting that God came for all men, and all men, there will be every nationality, tribe and tongue in heaven shows us, hey, I need to, to connect with my brothers and sisters because I'm gonna spend eternity with them there, even if they're not in my nationality. This faith is not exclusively for me, it's for everyone. I love it. Jesus is for everyone. Jesus is concerned for everyone. Jesus died for everyone and Jesus loves everyone. Well, after the break, what does coffee, Hollywood, and a Bible have in common? Stay tuned and find out. And we noticed, shockingly, that there was a table next to us with Bibles on the table. This was the first time I had seen a Bible in public in Los Angeles, ever. Your Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media. Are you a Christian singer, a musician, a worship leader, or a hip hop or spoken word artist, and you're looking for a platform to share your work? If so, I have exciting news for you. TPI is accepting submissions for music videos to air on the program. So please send a downloadable link of your music video and the song lyrics, the song copyright details and publishing details to tpimusic at cbn.org. Who knows, maybe one day I'll be introducing you to the world. Welcome back. For set designer Beckett Cook, success meant two things. Finding the man of his dreams and making a name for himself in Hollywood. However, a conversation in a coffee shop will change all that. Here's his story. I thought, okay, I'm gay. I can never be a Christian. That's not even an option for me because I, I can't, the, the two are irreconcilable. So I can't be a, be a part of that club. So at a very young age, I knew that I was attracted to the same sex. I had to keep it to myself. I dated, you know, girls and in elementary school, I went steady with girls in high school, I dated girls, but it was all a facade. After college, I just came out to everyone. That's when I fully embraced homosexuality as my identity. I ended up moving to LA to pursue acting and writing and, and kind of a creative, more of a creative field. And then I became a set designer. I worked with a lot of pop stars like Katy Perry and uh, Paris Hilton and uh, Oprah, like everyone you can imagine, I worked with them. I thought the whole purpose of my life, the meaning of my life was finding true love in another human being and a guy and finding in success in my career. After each relationship with a guy, 
And after it would end, I had total amnesia that it, how it all ended. And I would think, oh, the next guy is going to be perfect. And the next guy is going to be amazing. And of course, like two years later, it's over. You know, there's cheating, infidelity, and it's over. At this point in my life, I was very successful in my career as a set designer, production designer. I mean, I was doing covers for Vogue and for Harper's Bazaar. And, and I also started my own men's fashion line that was successful. Um, our clothes were in you know, LA, New York, Paris. I went to all the shows. I went to all the after parties. I was at this one after party in Paris. And I remember just everyone was there from the fashion world. I think Kanye was there that year. And I was kind of looking out over the crowd. It just struck me so profoundly. I was like, is that all there is to life? Just going to parties for the rest of my life? Is that all? Is this what it's all about? And I really started to panic that night. I was overwhelmed with a sense of emptiness. Got back to LA and got busy with work for about six months. I was at a coffee shop in Silver Lake with my best friend, and he was gay too. And we noticed, shockingly, that there was a table next to us with Bibles on the table. This was the first time I had seen a Bible in public in Los Angeles, ever. And by that point in my life, I was, I was a practical atheist. Finally, I just turned around and I said, are you guys Christians? And they he just, they laid it out for me. They told me what they believe. They told me the gospel. It was like two hours. And by the time, by the end of the conversation, of course, I got to the $64,000 question and I said, so what does your church in Hollywood believe about homosexuality? And they were just like, well, you know, we believe it's a sin. And what's interesting about that is, number one, I, I appreciated how kind of frank they were and honest, and they didn't try to dodge the question. They just said it. Secondly, because of that experience in Paris six months before, I was open to hearing that. They invited me to church the following Sunday. And I, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to go to your church, but I'll think about it. And then the following Sunday, I wake up and I'm like, I guess I'm just going to go to this church today. Ne I had never been to an evangelical church in my life. I didn't even know what it was, what it looked like, what it sounded like. I found my seat near the front. I just sat by myself. The pastor comes out and he starts preaching on Romans chapter 7 something strange started happening. Everything he was saying, every word he was saying, every sentence he was saying started to resonate as truth in my mind and my heart, and I didn't know why. I was on the edge of my seat, literally on the edge of my seat. It was the first time I had really heard the gospel and understood it. And before he left, he invited people to get prayed with on the side of the church. I go up to this guy, a stranger, and I say, I don't know what I believe, but I'm here. And he said, okay, let me pray for you. And he laid hands on me and prayed for me. It seemed really intense and long. And I just remember thinking, why does this straight dude love me so much? Because it seemed so loving what he was saying and praying. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is just like, <sighs> like floods me and my mind, God has revealed himself to me in that moment. And he's like, He's like, I'm God, Jesus is my son, heaven's real, hell's real, the Bible's true, you're now adopted into my kingdom, welcome. And I was like, whoa! <laughs> and I just like started bawling, hysterically bawling, and I couldn't stop crying. For the rest of the service, I was crying harder than I, I had ever cried in my life, maybe since I was an infant. And, and I knew in that moment, I knew in, to the core of my being, that being gay was no longer who I was. I knew that that was no longer a part of my life. And, but I didn't care. Like, I had just met Jesus Christ. I didn't care. Like, that was like the last thing I cared about. And I was like, okay, I'm done with that world. I'm done with that life. And I have, I have this new life in Christ. Some people might say that I'm just suppressing who I really am. But 
they don't get it because you know I lived that life for a really long time, and I I marched in gay pride parades. I I marched in gay marriage equality parades. I was super gay. I tried that for 30 years. This is actually really who I am now. My hope is that people will realize how much more amazing it is to deny yourself and follow Christ rather than to just give in to sin now just to satisfy some Im immediate need or urge. So it's not a happiness from the world, it's a joy that comes from Christ. With God, I feel this unconditional love from Him that will never leave. Like, He'll never leave or forsake me. I'm happy to leave that dead man behind because he's worth it. A relationship with God is so worth it. The life he left behind doesn't compare to the joy and fulfillment Beckett found in Christ. Beckett said, it's so much more amazing to deny yourself and follow Christ than to pursue sin and the emptiness of worldly pleasures. There's more to life than parties, hookups, and shallow relationships. The gospel is real and God's words are true. The same way God revealed himself to Beckett, he can reveal himself to you. Listen to these words from Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call out to him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. Do you want Jesus to change your life like he changed Beckett's life? If so, pray these words after me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I acknowledge that I don't have all the answers for myself. I acknowledge that the things I've tried, they don't work. I confess, Jesus, that I've sinned against you, but I thank you that you died on the cross for me. I accept the love that you offer through your death on the cross. Jesus, I confess that you are Lord. Amen. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who said this prayer. I ask that you would intervene in their situation right now. I ask that you do something that no counselor, no wisdom, no financial intervention can do. Give them that peace which is past anything they've ever known in their lives. Amen. Well, if you need further prayer, or would like to know more about having a personal relationship with Jesus, please message us on WhatsApp. We have prayer counselors standing by to pray with you and to answer your questions. For our viewers in the United States and in Europe, you can call us using the number on your screen. Now, don't you worry if you haven't got the number, we'll have the information for you during the break. And don't go anywhere, we have more for you on TPI. Family, this year TPI is celebrating its silver anniversary. TPI is able to air life changing content because of the generous giving of CBN Africa partners. Would you consider partnering with us so we can continue to bring the quality Christian programming to you, your children, and grandchildren for another 25 years? Please visit our website and click on the donate button to become a part of what God is doing. Through TPI, no gift is too small. On behalf of the entire TPI team, I want to thank you for your support, for your prayers, your kind words for the last 25 years. And our hope is that TPI will continue to transform lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
one show at a time. Welcome back. I'd like to invite you to join the TPI family. Go to our website, hit the subscribe button, and you'll receive updates about all things TPI. While there, would you consider becoming a monthly financial partner? Scroll to the top and hit the donate button. Your gifts ensure that we can continue to provide life-changing television for another 25 years. Well, we've reached the end of the show, but I have one final thought that I want to share with you. It's from the jazz legend Ella Fitzgerald. And she says, it isn't where you came from, it's where you're going to that counts. Amen. From all of us here at TPI, goodbye and God bless you. Everybody's telling me it's done. Feeling like I'm about to throw in the towel. Face the fight or turn away and run. Then I remembered that you are always for me. If you've said it once, I've heard it twice. I can always trust you with my life. With eyes of faith, I still believe, yeah. That it's not over till you say so. Say so. Till you say so. It's not finished till you say so. The final say over every circumstance, your purpose for me will come to pass. Lord, you have perfectly orchestrated such a wonderful plan for me. So why should I doubt you now? You've shown me from time that if you said it once, then I've heard it twice. I can always trust you with my life, with eyes of faith, I still believe, oh, 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 that it's not over till you say so, say so, till you say so, it's not finished till you say so. Not finished till you say so.